Okay, welcome everybody uh, to the Cutting Edge Issues and Development Thinking and Practice Series at the London School of Economics. I'm James Futzel, Professor of Development Studies and one of the co-chairs of this activity on a weekly basis and along with my uh, colleague Duncan Green, who will be joining us shortly. His apologies for not being here yet. I am really delighted today to be able to welcome back to the school after, you know, 12, 13 years, uh, Lise Grand, um, who's a major figure in international humanitarian work. You know, I, I met Lise uh, way back in 2005 in the Democratic Republic of Congo where she was in one of these multiple missions she's participated in, which I find, you know, absolutely intractable and impossible missions. And she has spent over 25 years doing that, you know, originally picked up by the UN, uh, where she had been doing work in Palestine. And um, uh, af after that, when I met her in the DRC, it was a time of an attempt to consolidate peace. We were three years into the peace agreement with warring factions of quite a vitriolic nature in the Eastern part of the country. And the person I went to to begin to learn about this conflict was Lise. Um, and I began to understand what a no-nonsense, talented person she was. Um, she has um, also, she went on to serve as humanitarian coordinator in the lead up to the independence of South Sudan, a very difficult project in itself, and was there in the preparatory period. And I think for a year after statehood uh, was declared um, a very fraught place as we can see today uh, still. Uh, she had previously served as deputy representative of the UN assistance mission in Iraq during the military campaign against ISIS. And from what I understand, she was in charge or played a very major role in one of the largest evacuations of a civilian population from a war zone that was ever taken, undertaken by the UN. Her last UN post before taking up the leadership of the US Institute for Peace, where she is now um, president and chief executive officer was as UN re uh, resident and humanitarian coordinator in Yemen, uh, one of the largest and most dangerous UN missions in history. And of course, a conflict that is ongoing uh, in the extreme. So over her career, she served in Armenia, Angola, East Timor, Palestine, Tajikistan, Sudan, in Haiti, and I know she had one small period of respite in India as UNDP resident coordinator, um, which must have been a period of rest or something, which it sounded like you would have needed many more of those type of periods and appointments, uh, Lees. So I'm really delighted to have you here to speak to our students after such an illustrious career, which goes on now from your, your very senior position in Washington. And as discussed in tonight, we have our own Professor David Keane. I won't go on with such a long introduction, but he's a very also intrepid character who's written about conflict, who's written books on Sudan, uh, who um, recently, um, probably maybe most recently, David, I'm not sure, was doing uh, research among refugees from Syria. Um, he's written a book that seems to have uh, had an impact on Lee's called um, uh, Useful Extremes. Uh, David is- somebody uh, Useful who, Enemies. Uh, useful yes. Enemies, I'm sorry. Yes. They, they were extreme, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and David has a, a raft of scholarship under his belt and is uh, one of the people who lectures on crisis, on, on um, um, uh, emergencies. Um, complex emergencies at the LSE for the past, uh, gee, I think almost 20 years now. I won't say more. Um, so we'll start 
turning over with Lise Grand. Thank you very much, Lise, for coming to speak to us today. I'm delighted to be with all of you and want to thank Professor Putzel James for inviting me for your very kind introduction and also express my respects for Professor King who's joining our conversation uh, this afternoon. I'd like to do two things. First, I'd like to reflect on some of the key dynamics and factors that are likely to drive conflict in the next quarter century. And second, I'd like to look at the mechanisms and the tools that are currently being used to prevent, mitigate, and resolve conflict, and to share some candid observations about whether those tools are likely to be effective in the next quarter century as we address new drivers of conflict. If we start first with the drivers of conflict that are probably going to create, or we expect are likely to create the most conflict in the next 25 years, there are three that I would like to forefront. The first is the impact that rivalry between China, Russia, and the United States is likely to have in creating conflict. As China and Russia seek to enhance their status as major powers alongside the United States, most experts expect to see a sharp rise in conflict in the regions and countries where these powers are attempting to expand their cultural, economic, military, and political influence. There is also the possibility, we all hope less likely, that conflict could erupt between several or all of these powers, dragging the world into a catastrophic global war where the use of weapons of mass destruction is possible. A second key driver of global instability in the next quarter century is almost certainly going to be the spread of authoritarianism, the spread of new and existing extremist forces and the threats that are posed by terrorist movements and criminal networks. The threats posed by these forces are particularly acute in fragile countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Libya, countries which lack institutional mechanisms for reducing violence they lack mechanisms for addressing popular grievances and the mechanisms that they have for managing tensions are under enormous stress. A third key driver of instability in the next quarter of century are almost certainly going to be the disruptive global shocks that are and will continue to occur because of climate change, because of resource scarcity, pandemics. Already we see this 14, of the 25 countries that are most vulnerable to climate change are right now mired in conflict. Water scarcity alone has been the cause of 500 separate clashes and localized conflicts in just the past 13 years. And as many of us already know, we're projecting that within the next 30 years by mid-century, as many as 200 million people across the globe may be forced to migrate because of resource scarcity. We're also seeing new risks to global security as countries struggle to stop and recover from COVID-19 and as major and emerging powers exploit the new global inequities that are being created by the pandemic. There are other profound changes underway which have the potential to significantly impact the way that we address and try and solve these drivers. Let me share three of these changes. First, the propulsive proliferation of the risks to peace. Second, the stress on the world's existing peace institutions. And third, the shifts in the parameters of global cooperation, the norms upon which these institutions rest and are structured. It's a truism that the risks to global peace and security are proliferating. These risks come in multiple forms. There are two which I'd like to forefront, the reality of global power and the disruptive impact of new technologies. For the first time in nearly a century, we're no longer in a unipolar or even a bipolar world. 
where one or two countries exercise disproportionate influence and power. We're in a multipolar world with multiple centers of military, political, social, and economic power. Most experts believe that this diffusion of power is creating many more risks to global stability than when global power was concentrated. Leaders, parliaments, civil society, and the private sector are overwhelmed by the proliferation of risks. They're unable to prioritize and they're unable to concentrate resources on solving the most important of these, let alone most or all of them. We're also seeing a proliferation of risks that are linked to the disruptive impact of new digital and cyber technologies. These technologies are empowering individuals in unprecedented ways, but they are also being used to disrupt infrastructure, trade and commerce. They're being used to create new forms of authoritarian repression and new weapons of mass destruction. Very worryingly, many, if not most of these technologies are unregulated outside any framework of control. They are accessible to multiple non-state and hybrid actors. Many of these actors are malign and are using the technologies without sanction or restraint. The second important change that will impact how we address the drivers of conflict is the capacity of our existing global peace institutions to understand and mitigate and respond to the drivers. The multilateral institutions which have managed trade, protected refugees, resolved conflicts, and adjudicated justice since World War II were created at a different time to deal with different problems. It's not at all clear that these institutions can help to manage great power rivalry, that they can reign in authoritarian regimes, that they can degrade terrorist capabilities, diffuse economic shocks, control mass migration, help countries manage resource scarcity, or that these institutions can address the realities of a very unequal globe where two thirds of the world's most extreme poor live in settings characterized by fragility, conflict and violence. To do what's now necessary, these institutions are either gonna to have to evolve or be replaced by new and different ones. The third change, structural change, that impacts our collective ability to address the drivers of conflict concerns the rules-based international, the normative order, which was established after World War II and which the great powers have been the stewards of and the custodians of for the past 80 years. Although this order has been key to the enormous global advances we've seen in prosperity and democracy, there are countries which wanna change the norms now governing international trade and commerce, governing migration, space exploration, arms control, and the planet's environmental resources. Efforts are underway to change, to dismantle certain of the existing norms and protections, and to pivot toward new norms, which we have to expect during the pivot will lead to much more international, global instability. We know that the changing normative structure of global cooperation will impact how we address the drivers of conflict. What's not exactly clear though is how they will impact them and what we will do about that. That's a brief overview of some of the key drivers that we see driving conflict and how much harder it's gonna be for us to address these because of profound structural changes underway globally. But I'd now like to do, Professor Putzel, is to share with you a series of slides that summarize the way that peace building is currently done across the globe. These are the tools and mechanisms that we rely on. And just to recall for everyone, peace and security activities roughly fall currently into five categories. Of course, in practice, there's considerable fluidity between all five of these. The first category is conflict prevention. These are the initiatives that prevent tensions and disputes from escalating into violent conflict. The second category, of course, is peacemaking. These are the initiatives you undertake in the middle of a conflict that are designed to bring hostile parties 
to a negotiated agreement. Of course, there's peacekeeping. These are the initiatives that preserve peace when the fighting is stopped. Peace enforcement. These are the initiatives that are authorized by the UN Security Council to apply coercive measures to restore international peace and security. And then finally, of course, there's peace building. These are a whole group of initiatives that try to reduce the risk of either lapsing into conflict or relapsing into conflict by strengthening national capacities for conflict management. And now in the past two decades, there is an emphasis on laying the foundation for sustainable development. There are five types of engagement that run across those five categories. Much of the work that's done to resolve or prevent conflict in the world is diplomatic engagement. If you look back on the past 75 years, it is a very notable track record. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a summary of the main tools, peace building missions, special political missions, preventative deployments, arms control frameworks. Of course, there are 28 existing major frameworks in the globe right now. There are 12 major transboundary watershed agreements that have kept very unstable parts of the world stable. There are protection and migration conventions, enormous mediation efforts, good offices applied across the globe. Of course, there are UN ceasefires. The UN does interpose its forces as buffers between warring parties. There are formal contacts groups, informal contact groups. We do have international criminal accountability mechanisms. The much underappreciated role of UN resolutions, sanctions, and expert panels. The statements that the Security Council and the General Assembly will make in setting expectations. A huge number of track one, one, five, two, and three dialogues and the national dialogues. If you look at the next slide, there's humanitarian engagement. It's grown exponentially since the end of the Cold War. It now accounts for the overwhelming majority of direct engagement with belligerents. In the context of war, the people who talk the most to the people who are armed are humanitarians. This on the left-hand slide is a summary of how they do that. There are negotiated access frameworks, there are compacts, ground rules, days of tranquility, access arrangements, mine action, confidence building measures. The initiatives aimed at getting state and non-state actors to adhere to their obligations under international humanitarian law, the assessments we do, the civil military cooperation, humanitarian advocacy. The next form of engagement is development engagement. This is where most of the money is. If you look at it, how much money is put into diplomatic engagement and you compare that to humanitarian engagement, the bulk of financing sits here. It's primarily po focused on prevention and post-conflict recovery, but stabilization is a new and growing area. You can see on the right-hand side, the just wealth of activities, early warning systems, efforts to stabilize economies that are in trouble, concessional financing, work that's done to speed the delivery of public goods, capacity building for the regional institutions and so forth. It also includes countering violent extremism, DDR, economic stimulation at the end of war, electoral assistance at the end of wars, security sector reform and transitional justice. And of course, it includes work we do to promote good governance and anti-corruption. If you look at the next area of engagement, this is with civil society. Much of this work is focused on community practice, on networking, on learning. It includes customary practice, customary adjudication, negotiation, and mediation. If you're on the front line in the war and you want to mitigate violence, that's how it's done that first bullet. 
also includes local resource sharing agreements, adaptation strategies, the institutional networks that are formed and reinforced and strengthened, women's networks, youth networks, engagement with religious leaders, nonviolent action, and inclusive peace processes. And then finally, there is the role of the private sector, a very underconceptualized form of engagement in preventing wars, mitigating conflicts, and resolving them. Most often ignored by professional peace building entities. If you're on the ground, you ignore it at your peril. This includes accountability dispute mechanisms. For example, if a company wants to build a dam and local communities don't want that, one of the best ways of resolving that conflict are through these accountability dispute institutions and mechanisms that are being established. Socially responsible business practices are part of this, cause-related marketing, dialogues with belligerents. You know, an awful lot of the free movement of goods and people in the context of wars is actually the private sector that gets those goods moving and works out arrangements for people to move. They also are a source of capital and financing. It's very informal, often extremely rapid. As of course we know in many wars, one of the unexpected things that happens is that you have market penetration and market expansion, particularly into remote areas, most often by black marketeers. And then of course the patronage networks that the private sector has and will often use to protect communities and to try and resolve conflicts. And then finally, my last set of observations is about a question I was recently asked with a group of students here in the US that said, if there were five things that we could do that would have the biggest potential impact in the area of peace building and making and enforcement, what would they be? So here is my um, um, response to that question. Um, if we could back the French initiative to suspend the use of the veto in the UN Security Council when there are mass atrocities, this would almost certainly be the fastest way to advance that key doctrine on the responsibility to protect. This, of course, is where the international community says um, to a country, you're not protecting your civilians, so there is a shared responsibility to protect them and we will take action. Second thing to do, appoint women to at least 50% of all mediator and envoy roles. I know colleagues are aware about 2% of mediators around the world are women, official ones. Why would we do this? Because it's the fastest way to modernize the good offices role. Second thing would be to negotiate right away new agreements on, or agreements on new weapon systems and to update existing ones. And the reason for this is because these frameworks are the foundation of the global security architecture. I think fourth, if we really want to have the impact in preventing conflicts and then preventing countries that come out of fighting from relapsing, we've got to rethink and overhaul security sector reform initiatives. If there's one area where we get it wrong almost every time it's here, current initiatives just aren't successful. And if you look at the 50% of countries that are back in war five years after the war has ended, this factor almost always appears. And then finally, I think it's pretty clear that it's urgently required for all of us to establish environmental arbitration mechanisms. This is one of the most promising ways of preventing resource conflicts, which are likely, as we shared at the beginning of our comments, to be one of the major drivers of conflict in the next quarter century. Just a, a final observation. Uh, James, when you and I were talking about this meeting, you said to me, could I please share some of my personal experiences? So this photograph is um, taken in Sana in Yemen. 
and this is outside the UN office. So when we would go to work every day. This is what it looked like. We were, of course, unarmed. So people who are building peace are often working in circumstances that are profoundly and deeply challenging. Professor, thank you for giving me the chance to share these first introductory reflections and observations with you. Professor Keene, I look forward to um, your conversation and to answering any questions from colleagues. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Can, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I mean, really fascinating practical suggestions and such a comprehensive overview of the problem. And I'm really literally in awe, particularly as a, not a particularly intrepid person, despite James's uh, kind remarks of your incredible career. Um, I, I guess I, I would start in a way with this, you know, very compelling picture that you've painted of the proliferation of threats. Uh, the pandemic, obviously, global heating. Uh, you're talking about a diffusion of power, a diffusion of technology, the um, digital economy feeding into some of those uh, dangers, uh, global heating feeding into conflicts, uh, and so on. And all of this, I think, is very uh, compelling and very alarming. Um, but I, I wonder whether we aren't at risk of um, being in the kind of a mentality that's got us into a lot of trouble already. Uh, and by that, I mean that, uh, you know, particularly perhaps in, in Washington, but also in London and many other places, it's, it's easy to look out at the world and see a very threatening place. You know? And this has a long history, as you, uh, you know, as we're all very much aware. And one could think about um, the fear of communism and how that fed into uh, a series of responses that were really uh, productive of humanitarian disasters, you know, on a massive scale, or the um, fear of drugs and crime, this kind of worldwide war on drugs, the war on terror is something that uh, preoccupies me a lot, as I know it, it does you. Um, I do feel that looking back over the last 20 years, the war on terror, which was in a way generated from this sense of threat for very obvious reasons in terms of 9-11, uh, produced a set of responses which uh, in some ways were worse than the threat that was being highlighted in terms of the human destruction, uh, but also the impunity that was generated for a whole range of governments and actors associated with those governments, um, as, as you'll know as well from your own experience, uh, who in a way signed up to the elimination of this threat, which everybody agreed was sort of the ultimate source of evil, but actually in the process of doing so had their own agendas, were creating an awful lot of violence, uh, massacring civilians in Sri Lanka, um, the abuses by uh, Iranian-backed militias, in Iraq in terms of the, uh, the war against ISIS that I know you, you know a lot about. Um, the uh, Assad government in, in Syria getting a degree of impunity in a way from pointing to ISIS as the ultimate enemy and indeed encouraging ISIS in many ways behind the, behind the scenes. These are very disturbing, perverse incentives uh, 
set up by uh, the war on terror. They had their equivalents when it was a war on communism. And I'm sure that as these conflicts evolve in the future, you know, we may well find that, for example, eco-terrorism is becoming more uh, common. Uh, I've been reading Andreas Mom's book, you know, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, where he wonders why there isn't more eco-terrorism, even to the extent that Extinction Rebellion and other groups are trying to get people to wake up to global heating and using forms of direct action. Uh, they have been labeled as terrorists uh, by the United Kingdom police, or at least bracketed with terrorism. Uh, so it's interesting that some of the people who are, as we were, trying to wake up to the way that our disasters are heading and draw attention, for example, to the abuse of migrants, letting people die in the Mediterranean, uh, returning them to be tortured in Libya and so on. Uh, some of these NGOs are themselves being in a way labeled as part of the problem. And it comes in a way, and to, to my point of view, from a certain security perspective, where it becomes actually difficult to speak out uh, against those processes, because you may be, as it were, incorporated into the enemy category yourself through a certain kind of discourse. And, you know, it was most explicit with President Bush when he said, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. Uh, so this is quite a dangerous environment. And to me, uh, the, the kind of highlighting of security threats carries this danger of casting, as it were, a veil of impunity over the various responses to those security threats. And I think that you mentioned a drift to authoritarianism. There, are, there is a sense in which there's a drift to authoritarianism, for example, within the United States. Now, that is feeding off a certain sense of threat around uh, mass migration, around uh, terrorism, and around a range of other issues. And I think there's a sense in which, uh, you know, this proliferation of disasters and overlapping disasters feeding into each other now that we have, there is a risk that that's going to fuel more and more a kind of a threat-based politics that's being instrumentalized by right-wing populists in particular, and will take us actually further and further from the international cooperation and from a concern with the truth and with evidence uh, that we need if we're going to actually tackle all these very difficult problems. So that kind of leads me on to a second point, which is, um, you know, in these different crises, there are certain things that are, in a way, extremely uncomfortable to say. And a lot of times, people who are working for NGOs, they might uh, want to say them, but feel afraid of being killed or being kicked out of the country. Uh, similarly, in the UN organizations, uh, sometimes I think the UN agencies have more power to to, to speak up, but they also have, you know, very particular constraints with which you'll be extremely familiar. Um, and I wondered if you could maybe even tell us more from your own experience about some of these issues that were in a way very difficult to address and how one actually goes about putting them on the agenda, practically speaking, uh, you know, given all the constraints that often that often apply. Uh, in my own research, you know, my more sort of detailed research about Sudan uh, in the late 80s particularly, and then Sierra Leone, the war in the 90s, I found that the United Nations agencies were generally pretty poor in uh, telling the world what was going on, especially when it came to government sponsored or government perpetrated abuses. And there are a number of reasons for this. I think it's a pattern that persists to quite a large extent, as we saw in Sri Lanka in 2009, and uh, we're seeing it to a certain extent in Ethiopia now, for example. Um, but 
from a practical point of view, how do you actually say the unsayable and get the uncomfortable onto the agenda? And, you know, I'm just, I've written here what might be some relatively unsayable things. Uh, all the aid to Palestine is not going to help too much if Israel is able to exert a lot of violence of various kinds against the Palestinians. Uh, the war on ISIS in Iraq um, came at a huge cost to civilians, which you will know probably better than anyone, uh, including abuses by militias that were lining up against uh, ISIS. Another one, humanitarian aid to Yemen is not going to fix the problem if major allies of the Saudis and sellers of arms, uh, such as the United States and United Kingdom, uh, don't denounce the instrumentalization of suffering uh, by the Saudi regime. In terms of DRC, um, I think, you know, historically aid to the DRC was not going to fix the conflict if Rwanda, for example, and Uganda were allowed to stir it up behind the scenes and they were seen as, uh, you know, the poster boys to some extent of the, of the Western powers. South Sudan, which you know well, um, in a sense that government very quickly acquired many of the habits of the Khartoum government that it was uh, growing up in opposition to. Uh, and in terms of the, you know, this war on terror uh, against ISIS, the Al Qaeda family tree, and other organizations like the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, um, you know, I come back to the enormous impunity for all the uh, range of people signing up to those wars on terror. The fact that corruption is often so much uh, worse within the the states and the counterinsurgencies that are trying to defeat this problem than it actually is within those prescribed rebel organizations. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of violence that goes largely unremarked upon. So I'm just wondering if you could sort of tell us more about, uh, it, it's almost an impossible question, like how do you speak about the unsayable? But you obviously have a huge experience of those highly controversial issues. How long have I been talking, James? Ten minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll stop. I just I mean maybe twenty more seconds. Sure. Uh, there's a dilemma in peacemaking between uh, having the kind of peace that's inclusive of all the parties that have been waging war. And you try to, as it were, lure them into the peacemaking process through offering them benefits, perhaps through offering them some degree of amnesty, uh, through incorporating as many of them as possible into the political settlement. That, I think, has the advantage that you're not driving people back to war. You know, you're giving an incentive for peace, but it's also sending a horrible signal, as you know, as far as the benefits of violence are concerned. So it's in, in a way, it's pragmatic, but it's sending a horrible signal when it comes to impunity. How do you, in terms of your practical experience of so many different uh, um, insecure environments, see that kind of trade-off between uh, e exclusion, uh, between sending out the right signal and then being pragmatic and getting people on board with your peace process and not driving them into violence. You know, there's such an extreme example in Rwanda, but, you know, the Hutu extremists were not taken on board in the peace process and they were not having it. Uh, and, the, you know, there are plenty of other examples of people being excluded and going, going to, to war or worse. So I'll stop there. Um, but uh, fascinating talk. And, and thank you. David, thank you. You raised some very difficult and challenging uh, uh, questions and comments, as usual. And I would debate some of them with you.
but it's not my place to do so. Lise, would you like to have an initial response to David and while our audience um, formulates their questions, please indicate in the chat if you have a question. And those of you watching on YouTube, please feel free that, to send in a, um, um, a question through the chat function there. And anybody who would like to ask a question anonymously can uh, send a personal direct message to Greta Seibel, who's here on the call, and she'll make sure I see it. So, please. Um, David, thank you. And you know, I, as I was listening to your comments, I, you know, it, it, it emphasizes a point that all of us uh, who uh, dare to tread in this domain know that we are in very perilous waters, whether we're trying to prevent or mitigate or resolve a conflict. I think that, that um, you know, when, when you're actually right in the middle of it and you're trying to do the right thing, you know, it, it really is about um, what is possible. What is possible at this moment, at this time, with these constraints, um, what can be done? And here, you know, I, I structured some of my first reflections bearing that very much in mind. So what is possible when the institutions which have to concentrate resources and assets and be applied in a way which can create leverage and change? What happens when those institutes, institutions don't work, when they're overwhelmed? That's a question to be posed. It's a very urgent question because it's not the same question that was posed 15 years ago, let alone during the middle of the Cold War, but it's a question we're facing now. Secondly, what are the norms, the rules of the game for how conflicts are managed? Those rules are changing, right? That normative understanding about what kinds of conflicts were allowed or not allowed, the use of mass weapons of mass destruction, the framework and the architecture and the norms underlying that are pivoting and evolving. So what's possible to do as a peacemaker is very fundamentally different now than it was even two years ago. The capacity of leadership to make decisions about how they will use the assets at their disposal to try and change the course of events is very much shaped by the political room that they have how they get to decide questions, whether they're allowed to by their political allies, by civil society, by the sequencing of the electoral cycle. These are questions which um, relate to the politics of the moment that we find ourselves in, the norms, the institutions, and the political space. You are right to point out that in every act we take, there will be intended consequences and unintended consequences. And those unintended consequences will produce more problems that will demand our attention and our action. Should we, as a corollary of that insight, step back from doing what is possible? Of course, that's a moral question that each of us have to answer. I think that when people talk about this moment, I've, the current secretary general refers to it as an inflection point. What he's really saying is the normative order, everybody, it's pivoting. This will impact the rules of conflict globally. Everybody, the institutions which we have relied on for a very long period of time to manage conflicts, to manage the use of first strike nuclear capabilities, Right, that those institutions and those frameworks are under pressure. And he is also pointing to the way in which the diffusion of power is limiting the ability of the stewards of global stability to do their work. So that it's not that you've got people waving, as we would say in Kansas, a bloody shirt, what they did in the Civil War, to get people excited or to overstate a cause or to incite panic. It's to take a step back, say, 
we're at an inflection point, what does it look like? More importantly, it's to say what can be done about that so that we limit destruction, prevent it where we can and mitigate violence however we must. Now, you know, is this an inflection point that is of a worse nature or more frightening than the inflection point that we faced at the end of World War II? You betcha it is. At the end of World War II, there was a clear concentration of power. So if you wanted stability, you had to get basically two countries to agree on a framework. You can't do that anymore. If you want to prevent the use of first and second strike nuclear weapons, it's a very different proposition than doing under the conditions of today than before. We don't want to lose that historical reality. We don't want to lose that sharpness of perspective. You raised a very interesting point about um, how you capture the attention of the right people at the right time to move the dial. Very complex issue, obviously multidimensional. So you can have, for example, very often happens in the United Nations, you will have various organs of the UN that are seized with the issue that appears once or twice in the international press, if at all. So the question then becomes, if you're trying to, for example, promote new agreements on navigation in the oceans. All right. Is it simply a question of getting the world's international media to focus on that? Is it a question of getting the organs which deal with that and the countries which control and shape those organs to deal with it? You know, my long experience in some pretty awful places in the world, there were times when you wanted every major news media in the world to talk about the issue every single day. And then there were times when what you really wanted were four crucial votes on the Security Council to be so overwhelmed with letters, right, to their White House or to 10 Downing Street that they took action. Then there were times when you were dealing with a matter that required consistent global attention across all the countries of the world. And you would approach that knowing that that's what you were trying to do. So I think many of us working in this environment, you know, we become, um, um, we become quite focused on what is, um, who does, where does the message need to land and how are we gonna get there the fastest? And this goes to the point that you're raising about the use of denunciation, the use of truth telling, um, and whether or not that is a requirement for people who are in these situations. I think you were implying that it was a requirement. And then how that's done in a way which has impact. Those are not always the same two questions. Your very interesting point, Professor, about the um, dynamics between inclusivity and the messy business of getting folks with guns to stop fighting. So I think a lot of us in the field sort of would, would understand that there are situations where getting the fighting done requires that there be a lot of people at a peace table. So the national dialogue, the discussion about the new dispensation was in fact coterminous with the cessation of hostilities. Those discussions happen at the same time. There are, of course, other situations where that doesn't happen, where you get the belligerents to stop fighting and then the inclusive national dialogue process takes place outside of fighting. As, you know, if you're trying to do a national dialogue, when there is actually fighting going on, it's obvious that the contours and the shape of that national dialogue will be shaped primarily by the fighting itself. And this is why very often you see a sequencing. So there's the agreement to end hostilities, 
sequence then with a process that is inclusive, that focuses on the new dispensation for the country, which the people of that country will have to decide for themselves. So I think it's not so much a dilemma between them, if I may, although I, I recognize the point you're making, but very often the practical way of addressing that question is to look at the sequencing of it and what makes the most sense. Um, those are just some of the, the first observations. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. And Thank you so much. David, yeah. David, we'll come back to you during the Q&A. Um, and so now we have our first three questions. Uh, the first one is put into us anonymously, and my colleague Greta will read it out. Then Pietro uh, Vernetti has a question. Um, and then a student who is watching this from the lecture hall. So therefore, I don't have their name. And both of those uh, students will come on and speak their own questions. So first of all, uh, Greta. Hello, I will actually have to read all their questions for different reasons. So the first one is anonymous and is asking you, um, saying there is new evidence that has found COVID-19 has led to the prolifer proliferation of violence in conflict affected areas. When looking to the future and possible rise in pandemics, how can broader community tactically reduce the risk of violence in the wake of new diseases? Pietro, has, who's in, the, um, in this call, has asked me to read his question because his mic is not working. And is asking you, do you think that the role of the UN in peacekeeping and peacebuilding operations, and in general, the organization's role in the international system is declining? And if so, do you think that has something to do with the role played by great powers such as the US? What are, could other causes be, for example, in credibility? I think if I got that right, the student hall is asking me to read out their question, unless that person wants to come in. Well, they're welcome to interrupt me, otherwise I might, I might read their question. Um, when talking about peace enforcement, is it counterintuitive at some level to have coercive peace? When such peace is forced, can it be long lasting? And what, has, what happens when the coercive force is taken out? The chaos in Afghanistan comes to my mind. So those are the first three. I think we're all very excited to hear your answers. Thank you, Greta. Go ahead, Lise. Um, you know, so on the, I'm not sure, Greta, I actually got the, the, um, the leader on the pandemic issue. May I ask, was our colleague suggesting that there was not a correlation between the pandemic and violence or that there was? They are suggesting there was a correlation between COVID-19 and the proliferation of violence. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think I would agree with that. I think that's, that's um, quite clear. Um, so how do you prevent that? I believe is the question. That's right. Um, I think you would prevent that in many of the ways that you would try and prevent resource conflict. So if it is very clear that you're in a fragile state and that the mechanisms for allocating scarce resources to solve pressing problems is not transparent or is ineffective, and then you have a very big problem that comes on top of that, you should expect that there's going to be conflict and violence. And I think that's what we're seeing. Now, how does that get addressed to very obvious ways. The use of the resources that you do have is transparent and meets some threshold of fairness. So if only rich people in a country get a vaccine and no one else gets it, that might be transparent, but it won't meet a fairness threshold. And of course, the second way is how do you either improve the delivery of the resources you do have to solve the problem or get more resources to spread. So if you look at how the response to the vaccine or to the, the crisis in COVID, what you saw in a number of countries was a very intentional, very rapid pivoting and reorganization of the national resources they had to try and address it. Very often, if, for example, if you looked in parts of Africa, the parts of the health system that had been focused on HIV and AIDS which were very community focused, were re and repurposed very quickly to deal with COVID. That was a 
very clear example of how governments were looking at the resources they had, redirecting them to try and deal with the new problem. Of course, at a certain point, additional resources, vaccines, and other necessary equipment to address the pandemic, if you didn't have those, you had to get them from somewhere. Now, I think where the international system was expected to act was to provide financing for countries so that they could augment their own national capabilities and resources very quickly. We let them down. Secondly, the international community was looked to to provide in-kind additional resources, not just financing, but the actual vaccines themselves. These were scarce commodities. It was completely unrealistic to expect in real time the countries would be able to develop that capability. They had to be distributed globally in a way which was transparent and met a threshold for fairness and neither occurred. Have we learned a lot from that experience? You betcha, we have. Is there now a call for rapid concessional financing mechanisms that would be made available to national governments in the advent of another pandemic? Yes, there are. Are those mechanisms in place yet? No, but there's a recognition that needs to happen. Are there systems for the management of a scarce resource like a vaccine? Arguably here, there's been much more learning and you, of course, I'm sure are aware of the now very advanced discussions on creating an international entity. God bless us, it may be another UN agency that deals with things like vaccines, these rare commodities that are essential for getting a global pandemic under control. And I think we should expect that within the next five years, we will actually see that kind of capability stood up and become part of the international architecture. On the, the question of the, the role of the, the UN in peacekeeping, Greta, if you could, I'm sorry, we had a, some noise on the line and I'm not sure I got the question right. Would you share that with me again? Yes, of course. Do you think that the role of the UN in peacekeeping and peace building operations and in general, the organization's role in the international system is declining? And if so, do you think that has something to do with the role played by great powers such as the US or what could be other causes? Mm, yeah, okay, that's a really interesting question. Declining, no. Changing, yes. So if you'd asked me that question, however, 10 years ago, I would have answered it differently. Um, there, I think it was very clear that um, there were very open questions about whether or not the UN as a global architecture with its institutions and its mechanisms and so forth, uh, whether or not that um, it was still gonna remain a, a vital part of, of global cooperation. Um, and the reason, of course, was because China didn't seem to be that interested in the UN. China's very interested in the UN. There's absolutely no question whatsoever that um, one of the world's great powers uh, sees the UN as a uh, necessary part of uh, global engagement. Um, you are absolutely correct, the colleague who asked the question, in pointing to the fact, however, that that is changing. So the stewardship of UN engagement, um, certainly during the Cold War, the range of that engagement was very limited by the rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union. In the first 10 years after the Cold War, it was very clear that the US exercised disproportionate influence in the way that the UN would take on problems or reject certain problems or use certain instruments to solve certain problems. The US was very influential in that. Now it's um, um, different. Uh, do we yet know how this will currently, you know, the shifts in global power will influence the UN? No, we don't. I can't tell you a, a, one thing though that, that everyone who's on the ground for the UN will, will immediately point out if you were posted to a, a, a country in conflict as the UN representative, um, what you basically did is you looked at the most powerful country that had influence over that regime. 
and you put them on speed dial and you talk to them all the time. And one of the things that you now see, those of us who you want to talk about all the time, um, is that you will arrive. For, when I got to, to Sana in Yemen, I was like, now who, who do I call? <laughs> Who's going to exercise leverage and influence and um, power on the regime of the belligerents to get this thing solved? It's pretty obvious a couple of years ago how to do that, not now. And that points to the, the way in which what you're suggesting about the, the changing points of leverage within the UN system that reflect changes in global power, they definitely have an impact on the ground. They do. Um, peace enforcement. So this, of course, of the five strings of, of peace and security initiatives, it is the one that is used the least. It is the one that is most conscribed by a legal framework. Peace enforcement is um, technically only done at the UN Security Council, invokes a certain part of the charter to do that. Um, the UN has been extremely reluctant to the permanent members of the Security Council because it goes against the core fundamental parameters, the norms that have shaped peacekeeping up until this point. Now, those norms may change, but up until this point, it's peacekeeping has been based on three norms. Um, the sovereignty of the, the country, we have to be impartial. We can only uh, engage if uh, we have the consent of the parties. And um, we only use lethal force in defense of the mandate. Well, ourselves, basically. Now, those norms, I think, might change. If I, I come from Texas, play a lot of poker, if I were betting, I bet those norms will change the next time we're together in a meeting. But for now, those are the norms, and they have shaped uh, the considerations of the council, most importantly on the issues of uh, peace enforcement. The biggest challenge to that, of course, comes from the doctrine on the responsibility to protect. Of all the things that were most unexpected for me in my long years with the UN was when the international community embraced that in the early knots. Yeah, I, I remember in the, the 90s when there were some Jacobins inside the UN that would say, right, we need to get the UN to act in cases where governments are predatory, where they're not protecting their civilians. In fact, they're attacking and killing them. There's an international responsibility to do something when that happens. Yeah, I remember looked at like you're crazy. That goes fundamentally against the entire way in which international peace and security is structured. And within 12 years, the member states of the United Nations embraced that doctrine. Yeah, that, that, phenomenal. The people who worked on that, phenomenal. It is, of course, a doctrine that is not yet embedded in the DNA of the global peace and security structures, but it has been adopted. It is a live wire. And I think many of us who care very profoundly about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights have expectations that it become part of the DNA. Not sure it will be, but it's certainly been embraced. It was adopted. It is now doctrine. Thanks, Lise. We have, um... We have some more questions now, and let me, um, again, we have two anonymous ones. So first of all, uh, Nihal Ahardin, would you like to say, speak out your question? Nihal? Do we have Nihal there? Okay, so let me read out Nihal's question and then I'll turn to Greta for the anonymous ones. Uh, so Nihal asks, how has the very ethic of accountability come to exhaust itself in the present liberal world order? And our other two questions, one is very big picture, asking you, do you believe a world without conflict is possible? 
what would need to happen for this to occur. And then the second question picks up on uh, a proposal put forward by, friends, by France that you mentioned before. That proposal was to remove the Security Council veto in response to mass atrocities. And the troubling use of the veto and inability of the Security Council to agree in recent times largely came about after the French and NATO intervention in Libya in 2011, which essentially led to the discarding of the concept of the responsibility to protect after almost its first use. How can we repair relationships and rebuild trust within the Security Council, given the current state of great power competition? Yeah, those are important, very difficult questions to, to uh, confront. Uh, has the liberal order and accountability exhausted itself? So of course, you know, the problem with any order is that there are some folks that just get away with murder and that's legitimized within the order itself. And that ends up raising profoundly um, difficult questions for political and social organization and mobilization. Do I think that the liberal order has reached its um, reckoning point? Not sure, not sure. I mean, if you just look at who's gotten really rich out of the pandemic and the complete lack of accountability or responsibility for the redistribution of those resources, yeah, there's, the liberal order is still happy to move right along even with this fundamental, you know, almost grotesque reality and with no mechanisms to change that. Um, are people exhausted by that? I'm not sure. Um, in my career, I worked in uh, almost half the countries I were in, you could consider them to be in a revolutionary moment. You know, is the world itself at a revolutionary moment, not just individual countries? I think we're at an inflection point. I'm not sure at a revolutionary moment. Is the liberal order at a revolutionary moment? You know, in my generation, when I was at university, we, we all had to read the 18th Brumar by Karl Marx, which of course is written at the height of the revolutions in 1848. And you know, it's an astonishing piece of work because he's a journalist and he's in the middle of what at the time was like one of the biggest revolutionary moments, you know, in centuries. And, you know, the, the, one of the reasons we all had to read this was, you know, the challenge was if you're in a revolutionary moment, you actually know you are. Right. And how do you understand that? Of course, one of the extraordinary things about Karl Marx is he was in a revolutionary moment and he did know it. Many of us might be in a revolutionary moment and not even know it, which is a way of answering a question about has, you know, have we exhausted accountability, which is another way, of course, of asking have we exhausted the legitimacy of the liberal order? You know, maybe we have and I wouldn't even know it. Um, is there a world without conflict to be you know, fervently hoped for, I'm guessing probably and certainly in, in my lifetime, no. Maybe in the lifetime of colleagues on the call, we would hope. But because we don't necessarily want to put money on it happening, doesn't mean that you don't fight for it, mobilize for it, engage for it, and do everything within your ability and those of your, um, family, friends, and colleagues to, to try. Um, the veto. Yeah, so, you know, the veto is, of course, simply a reflection um, of the way in which the five permanent members of the council uh, want to or not want to cooperate. Um, I think what's so interesting about what France is doing is saying, well, we get that, but we wanna carve out an area of issues that we don't actually care whether anyone gets along with. They are of such overriding importance to humanity that the veto will not pertain. I think that is an extraordinary act of confidence 
and a projection of universal morality. It is breathtaking in its implications. And it's why I put it at the top of the list. Do I think it will pass? It might, it might, it might, it just might. You know, we, at the end of the 19th century, of course, there was great hope that we shared that commitment to the abolition of torture. I know everyone knows this, but you know, most states had um, eliminated torture. They had, um, forbidden it. And of course, during the 20th century, almost everyone practices it now. But there was a moment, you know, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, where we were trying to carve out activities which we simply would not tolerate as humanity. And I think that this act of saying there is this thing called mass atrocities, which we will not stand. You as powers in the country, in the world, you are not allowed to um, instrumentalize it because of lesser concerns that you have. I, again, I think it's, it's remarkable. It is possibly one of the truest expressions of the aspirations of the, the UN Charter in recent um, memory. But now on the responsibility to protect, you know, so, you know, doctrine is one thing, then you got to get practice right in behind you. You can have a doctor, but if there isn't practice associated with it in institutions and resources and initiatives behind it that make it real, then it will languish. And, you know, that's the responsibility of all of us to mobilize. So the doctrine on the responsibility to protect has been embraced. Now we've got to make it real. It needs to fight for it every day. So if it didn't work on Libya, maybe it will work on Ethiopia. It's our responsibility as world citizens to do what we can to make that happen. Okay, thanks, Liz. Um, I'm holding back my own, my own questions. Uh, to privilege the students first. And um, we have a, a question from YouTube. So I'll read that one out from Mark. And then Pierre uh, uh, Bourgeois, um, who will, I think, read out his own question. Um, so Mark asks, the people who speak most to conflict parties are humanitarians, uh, referring to what you said. Can you elaborate how that speaking contributes to peacemaking beyond the delivery of life-saving aid or undermines it? And then is, is Pierre on the line? Can you read out your question? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Um, my question is just how realistic would it be to assume that international institutions such as the United Nations are capable of change um, specifically in regards to uh, peacekeeping and, and peace enforcement. Um, how would this change look and what would be the driving forces behind, behind the change? Thank you. Great. Do you want to go ahead and answer those two, Liz? So, um, you know, when humanitarians are engaging with belligerents, it's on quite a narrow range of issues. It's about um, getting um, life-saving um, supplies into an area, ensuring that the belligerents don't interfere with uh, how those life-saving supplies are distributed. Um, in other words, they can't tell us who to give things to. Um, it's about making sure that we can get in there and do assessments and monitoring. When humanitarians negotiate that quite narrow band of issues, we learn a lot about um, how the belligerents regard their populations. Are they predatory to them? Do they see themselves as liberators? Do they hold certain um, acts of uh, human endeavor higher than killing? You know, we wanna keep these people alive. Yes, you can come in. You learn an awful lot. You learn about the way in which the movement um, understands um, its role. And you also get a sense of where the, of course, very important for any kind of mediation, the value structure of uh, the belligerent forces. Now, as we all know, that value structure changes enormously under the pressures of war. One of the things I've noticed about a lot of uh, mediators for whom I have nothing but enormous respect, 
um, is they will, because they're not actually on the ground dealing with the belligerents, they're dealing with spokespeople, <laughs> they will often have a very static sense of what the core interests are, motivations and value systems of the people that they're working with. Well, those are changing phenomenally during the course of the war. Right, but they won't have that day-to-day -day engagement with them and they won't really bring that kind of um, absolutely essential knowledge to the mediation process. You know, you, you can't mediate in hotel rooms, I think most humanitarians would argue. Humanitarians bring that. Of course, we're never asked by mediators what we think about that process. Um, there is now, of course, a generation of mediators who recognizes that humanitarians are probably the most knowledgeable people in any war about the fighting forces, again, what they care about, what they don't care about, how they behave, where the pressure points can be on them, you know, how uh, an agreement can be reached that can be negotiated. Because, of course, the negotiation requires that you are convincing people to do something. They have to be willing to do it. And that essential sociological empathy or logical knowledge about them is coming from the, the humanitarians. You know, does humanitarian aid contribute to conflicts? So, it, you know, it, I would suggest that that's a badly posed question. Right? Humanitarians don't contribute to, are not, um, they do not as their intention or are driven by the uh, expectation that they are contributing to conflict or not contributing to it. They are keeping people alive in the middle of it. And of course, it is highly noticeable that the people who most often make that accusation are ones who can't figure out any other way to get the war over with. So I am very um, careful about assigning blame to humanitarians for the context, for the um, process of ending the war and negotiating it. They're the ones that keep people alive. They can create that war. I don't know any humanitarian who wants it to keep going. Okay, question on no, but let me just come back with a structural response. If you were structurally looking at the assets that belligerents will try and harness or capture so that they can continue fighting, you betcha they're looking at aid. All right, so you know, if you have a predatory belligerent force, so they're predatory over their population, that population doesn't support their aims. If that population is not able to exert pressure on the belligerents because they're hungry or they're starving, then keeping those people from dying is a structural factor or an asset, a resource, which the belligerents are very well aware of. Anyone who's worked a family will tell you that immediately. And that's certainly the last operation I was a part of in Yemen the fact that the international community fed half that country. Of course, this was a structural asset and feature that the Houthi were very well aware of and used to great effect. Does it follow that humanitarians therefore should change their course of action? No, I don't think it does, but that's a moral proposition. All right, that's a moral proposition. Um, on the question of how international peacekeeping will change. So, of course, it's changed a lot from when it started in 1948, when the UN went first into the Middle East with ceasefire monitoring and buffer zones and the kind of complex missions that we have now. Um, you know, the, the, there was a great deal of confidence uh, at the end of the, the 1990s that for a UN mission to help countries from relapsing into conflict. We had to help to create the conditions for sustainable development and help to create an environment where the new political dispensation could be discussed and debated and agreed by the people of that country. And this is where 
you know, these complex integrated multidimensional peacekeeping missions were born from. Um, you know, overall, the record is quite clear that UN peacekeeping taken as a whole has been effective. Have these integrated missions been effective in that part of the equation, laying down the conditions for preventing a relapse into war? I think there, you know, there is some important research there. I don't think it's very conclusive research. Um, there is, of course, a very important movement within the member states to rethink peacekeeping, to bring it back toward a more streamlined model where it didn't focus on trying to create the conditions. Sometimes this is called nation building. We don't try and do that. We're not equipped to We do a bad job of it. Many of the unintended consequences that Professor Keene was pointing to come out of that hubris. Member states know that. They're saying, stop that. Let's move us back to um, uh, an approach that is much more similar to the one that the UN originally adopted. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that ends up happening. I think that within the UN, the debates on peacekeeping are moving, the wind's going that way, more than into greater complexity. I don't see a lot of member states arguing for more complexity, but I definitely see the market for um, more focused, streamlined uh, missions. Where complexity is supposed to be dealt with is in the least resourced part of the slide on uh, you know, your tools, and that's on special political missions. So the most resourced, of course, are peacekeeping missions. Special political missions, you know, we send out mediators with two people and a bed net and a pencil and say, you know, go mediate. And there, there's a huge expectation of managing complexity without resources to match it. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. If I could um, throw in um, my own question, and maybe it takes you back to uh, something that David was saying earlier. Um, and it's the assessment of the big threats to peace going forward. And I, I must say that for the past 20 years, you know, one of the worst sources of fragile statehood and, the, and one of the worst sources of ex extensive violence has been that leading member of the Security Council, the United States of America that had taken out the state in Iraq. And we know how that proliferated decades of conflict. In a similar way, even as many would not like the shape or the character of the Gaddafi regime in Libya, it's very clear that taking out that state in the way that it was done it took a huge firepower to do it because there were sources of support for that dictator. And it unleashed not only a kind of violence that continues in Libya in a very persistent way, but has had a huge effect on the Sahel, on the neighboring countries um, in, in um, Mali and Niger, et cetera. And so it, it's, and, and these were done in very, questionable way in relationship to the gains of international law that had, you know, are very fragile anyway, but that had been there. And it's not China, I'm sorry, uh, China has one overseas base, and has not committed aggression against anybody else. And then the tensions that are coming from China are related to his, its own historic tensions that emerged, you know, out of its colonial experience with Hong Kong, and and out of its revolution with the establishment of a rival island republic under the protection of big Western power. So, I mean, I don't see China necessarily as the biggest destabilizer. And when you add to that this view that one could be on the precipice again of the return to power of an executive power in the United States that talks about countries as shithole countries and then that is shown how a US administration itself can act, you know, beyond international law 
tear up international treaties, etc. And we live in a country here that's not so good at respecting international treaties, another member of the Security Council, the United Kingdom. So it's in assessing those threats, it makes us, uh, you know, I, I can understand how people and our students and the audience could have a great sense of precarity going forward because mm -hmm. these powers seem to be the ones to some extent that are the most dangerous and it's in the hands of these very powerful forces that uh, we're kind of hoping that we'll get to something more peaceful. Sorry, but yeah. I had to, you know, raise that. <laughs> So I, but you're, you're pointing to something that, that, you know, is fundamental to international cooperation and to peace and security, which is what constrains the actions of great powers, middle powers and, and other countries. What constrains them? What legitimacy are, do those constraint mechanisms have? You know, during the, 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 the just astonishing period of the Cold War, you know, the Soviet Union, the United States could blow each other up with nuclear weapons. And the United States had done you know, blow up a place at the end of World War II with those weapons. And yet we agreed on a series of frameworks and mechanisms that constrained the use of that capability. Right? That's the architecture that I'm talking about. That's the architecture that's under threat now. And the implications of losing that architecture, allowing it to lapse, of taking our eyes off of it and worrying about other things is absolutely, to use your word, perilous. Right? That architecture has kept the world from mutual destruction for 80 years. It, it, is, it is cynical for us not to recognize that and commit to reinforcing it and upgrading it and, and finding mechanisms to constrain the capabilities that we have. And that's done through norms, through the exercise of constant negotiation, and it's done through institutions. That's why I structured the comments the way I did. That's what matters right now, so that we can constrain the kinds of actions. Now, Will there be examples of when those mechanisms of constraint are instrumentalized and manipulated? The United Nations voted to go into Iraq. So yes, there are clear examples of it. Does that mean they're not important? Of course they're important. You mobilize and you fight from the next day. You keep going with those. So you are right that we should worry. And it's not just constraints on the great powers, it's constraints on emerging powers who wish to exercise their influence by shows and demonstrations of their capability. You know, we, the, the institute that I have the, the privilege of being with now has just had a study group that looks at strategic stability and the relationship between the United States and Russia. And one of the areas that, that we spent the most, the study group focused the most on were regional tensions and conflicts that erupted into a major power, because, a major conflict, I'm sorry, because you weren't able to de-escalate or constrain effectively the actions of the medium powers. They spilled over into there. Now, for most of the Cold War, that was done. That's where we need to focus. Because it's that architecture that's at risk right now. Thank you, Lise. Before I return to David to kind of offer his kind of uh, wrapping up comments, et cetera, and back to you for the final word, Duncan Green um, will come in now. He's our co-organizer of this series. <laughs> Thanks, James. Yeah, well, it, you know, uh, you've broken the rules by asking a question, so I thought I'd come in too. Um, I was just thinking when I was the age of, um, of the students on school, um, nuclear war was the great thing that we were all terrified of, you know, where uh, all the women were going off to Greenham Common occasionally with the odd man in tow. Um, and that was the thing, you know, I was terrified of as a teenager even. And, and then it went away. And it's interesting, I've been struck by how much you've re referenced it in this talk, um, because it's, uh, and I wonder whether it's coming back. So my question is, um, you know, imagine a world in which 30, 30 countries have, have nukes, right? It's, it's not, it's easy if you try, I believe is the phrase. Um, 
So can you can you constrain the use of nuclear weapons with the same architecture as when n equals five? And if not, where do you draw ideas from for an n equals 30 nuclear system, which seems so much harder? That's the question. That is absolutely one of the fundamental questions. And then the other fundamental question is, how do we do exactly the same thing in the environment field? You know, the point that Professor Keene was raising about how, you know, by mid-century, we're going to have huge parts of the earth that are so hot we can't live there reasonably. So how do we constrain the actions of non-state actors and state actors? You know, all the private companies that are digging up the earth and creating this big mess. How are those constraints? This is the fundamental question. At the heart of global peace and security is that issue. Now, yeah, you know, if you looked at mutual deterrence, this was not a system, if you were a sensible, reasonable person, that you would ever bet would work. But it did. It did work. You know, in, in the discussions, for example, right now with China on strategic security, you know, the, the, the astonishing thing, and I know we all know this, but just to recall that the mutual deterrence system with Russia was based on transparency. We told each other how many weapons we had. And then we retained the right to verify and monitor what the other party was telling us. I mean, if you think about it, you have two adversaries that rather than hide things, it's all based on complete transparency. You know, and it, again, if you're a sensible person thinking about that, you would not have bet on that system. Now, of course, with China, it's a very different dynamic, very different. Here, the centrality of transparency as one of the fundamental norms of that architecture has not been embraced. So when I talk about you know, this idea of norm shaping how these mechanisms work, here's an example of that. So the norm of transparency was the bedrock for mutual deterrence. Strategic stability with new nuclear powers or growing nuclear powers, I'm not sure that norm pertains. In fact, it's quite clear it doesn't. So how do we find another set of norms that, const you know, that, that we can institutionalize in a way which can constrain our action? You know, these are these questions right now. We got roll up their sleeves and start talking about them. And not be afraid to embrace them because we're worried about generating a culture of fear. Right? We need some courageous leadership. Let me come back to David. David? Oh, thanks. Thanks, James. Um, I mean, I was just going to say maybe a smaller point and perhaps a slightly bigger one uh, in terms of, you know, what Elise was saying about. Um, being skeptical about blaming humanitarians for conflict or that humanitarian aid is somehow fueling conflict. I very much share that um, skepticism that she expressed. And I think we, we have got into a rather dangerous situation where people are kind of exaggerating the ability of humanitarian aid either to bring a conflict to an end, you know, contributing to peace building, or to fuel a war um, through the aid falling into the wrong hands. I think particularly the latter idea, you know, which is sort of expressed in a way in this injunction to do no harm that you sometimes hear about, is quite a dangerous idea because there are many instances and uh, Syria, is one of them, and Somalia is another, Sri Lanka is another, where if we get obsessed by this idea of doing no harm, the possibility that aid, humanitarian aid, can feed into a war, you know, it becomes very constraining on the delivery of humanitarian aid, and you actually get whole areas, vast areas, which are perhaps associated with a rebel group or a terrorist group, 
that are systematically deprived of aid, uh, in part because of that concern with do no harm and indeed with uh, counterterrorism. So I, 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 where I guess I sort of feel that humanitarians can do harm is more getting into the systematic misrepresentation of what's going on in a conflict. So giving the wrong impression about who's responsible for the majority of violence. I think that does happen. And I think that's that's very dangerous. In terms of the other point I wanted to make, which is a bit probably a little bit nebulous on my part, but uh, I definitely see these reasons for thinking that the world is a, a scarier place, you know, than earlier. I can see that in the Cold War, in a certain sense, you had to deal with two main um, sort of centers of of, of power. Now power is becoming in a way more, more diffuse. But I think this is really, I still believe that this is a reason to try to step outside. And I don't know what form this takes exactly. To step outside a security paradigm, mm -hmm. which is uh, to a very great extent, I think, shaped by the needs of the security structures that are already in existence. Uh, the military structures and so on, and to get away from the idea that uh, the, the fundamental task is to identify threats and then to find a way to mm -hmm. sort of right. take them out. And I do think that uh, there's a sort of a, a, a way of thinking. I don't think uh, Liz is subscribing to this, but it's, it's, it's too easy if we take in, if we become obsessed with security threats of one kind or another to think that we can, as it were, divide the world into the people who are enlightened, you know, who see all these threats, and then the people who've kind of lost the plot and constitute the threat. And James mentioned um, Trump and, you know, the danger of him coming back into the presidency and so on. I also think in relation to Trump supporters, which is a huge group of people, you know, we're seeing, a, in a way, a lot of self-righteousness from uh, liberals, from intellectuals. We're seeing a kind of a willingness to point the finger at the people who are unenlightened, who've lost the plot. We're seeing a sort of unwillingness to ask about the lives of those people, the historical trajectory that led them to a particular position which is a, a process that James uh, quite rightly, I think, invoked in relation to China, a very different, uh, a very different scenario. But still, it's that process of trying to understand uh, how people, through dialogue, you know, how key, people came to adopt the position that they have adopted. And I can't help feeling that that... It, kind of combined with a commitment to nonviolence uh, and a commitment to telling the truth about these different conflicts is kind of to me that's 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 the way to go and that will look very very woolly in a way but uh, I still think it's, it's kind of worrying about the proliferation of security threats, it has to be done, but uh, I have a lot of worries about that exercise in itself in a way which, which remain. And often it gets very quickly racialized, as you know, uh, which is another, uh, another problem. Um, David, that's an- Last a word, you get the last word, Lee. yeah. I was gonna say that's a, you know, just a, you know, a, a, a very, very thoughtful setting of the problem. I think, you know, there's an issue that, that we all recognize. There are um, forces and dynamics that literally can drive uh, uh, people, uh, country, countries, states into conflict. Getting a sense of what those are, seeing if anything can be done about them is important work. There is the very interesting problem set that you're referring to, which is the way in which that process coincides with 
the construction of the justification for going to war and the use of force. And, you know, of course, what's very interesting about that is that in modern states, that is a requirement, right? You basically, if you are leading those states, you have got to justify why you're using force. And as of course, we know that has not always been the case um, in um, even in modern history, but it is a requirement. And so, you know, what you see and what you're pointing to is a, a very um, complex dynamic where the way in which we analyze the problem becomes a justification that's used for the use of lethal force that will result in destruction and in death and, and how that narrative is constrained and challenged and interrogated and, you know, constantly pushed is of course one of the responsibilities of all of us as citizens and you know is quite frankly most effectively done by the fourth estate by the media which is a point that you raised very effectively in your first set of comments when you talked about how critical it is in these contexts that the media um, that we recognize the role of the fourth estate that we engage with it and that that fourth state acts in the pursuit of truth and interrogation of these justifications that are used when lethal force is, is being applied. But if I may perhaps um, you know, gently suggest that, that the clarity between the structural factors and forces driving toward conflict, and then the, the very um, important ways in which uh, leaders uh, justify and legitimize the use of force is something we we want to bear in mind. And also, you know, the we you know the fact that the leaders do have to justify the use of force. And that takes me to a point that I, I think is also very important about what you're you're touching on. And you know, this is the way that citizens uh, Citoyen and the, you know, the French concept of a, a living informed person, part of a social polity, you know, that that we um, demand peace, that we keep saying to leaders, uh, that's not a legitimate, that's not, that your argument doesn't legitimize the use of force in Syria to destroy half the country. It doesn't legitimate the use of force in Ukraine or in Tigray, wherever it is. And you know, the, the um, you know, James, you were talking about, well, I think it was actually Duncan was saying, you know, I, I, some of us who have you know, a lot of gray hair, we grew up in, you know, the informed mass mobilization of the citizenry against nuclear uh, deployments and the implication, of course, of those deployments that we would be in nuclear war. You know, I, I completely agree that the role of us in civil society to not only interrogate the arguments that be made to legitimate the use of force, but to insist that our leaders manage these conflicts in a way that does not lead to death and destruction is of the utmost importance. You know, one of the things that I admire so much about peace building organizations is how seriously they take uh, that role you know, to support grassroots organizations so that people have the opportunity and resources to demand peace, keep demanding peace, demand that their leaders not lead us into situations of mass destruction and mass death. I think it's some of the most important things of all the things I've put on those slides. I think that's, that's one of the most significant. I think this is a really good point at which to end. I was just thinking of you know, a few years ago when I was in Bogota and was able to sit in the peace camp um, where people had traveled from all over the country to demand that the peace be maintained, that it be implemented, the peace agreement. But just before I thank you, Lise, if I could just remind the audience on YouTube and on Zoom that next week we'll be welcoming Isabella Weber talk talking about her book, which is a much celebrated, much talked about book around the world on why China managed to avoid shock therapy. Um, 
And so I hope everybody can join us for that. Isabella Weber is a hot item. <laughs> and uh, if you want to know about China and its development, its economic development, uh, distinct from other former socialist countries, attend next week. So on that note, I mean, Lise and David, I hope you can join, um, hang on for a bit, but we want to say goodbye to our audience. Thank you for participating. And thank you, Lise, for coming with your vast <laughs> experience. Um, and, and, and next time we'll ask you about your earlier studies at Stanford and the New School. Uh, it's an amazing career that you've had so far. And you have a quite a bully pup, pulpit in Washington now. <laughs> Uh, which I hope you can use to, to, to great effect. And David, as always, thank you for honest, direct, and challenging questions and contributions. So until next week, thanks, everybody. And Deepa will tell me when we're offline. Or when everyone